You said 24 miles a day. That's about seven, eight hours of walking a day. So take us through a typical day, like just walking around. But yeah, at the beginning it was like, what did I do? This is a horrible decision. Scariest by mile was getting held up at gunpoint in Turkey. There's a lot of scary moments, but it's a long story. Ultimately, I get a shotgun put against me up in the mountains just north of Syria. And it was such a like dark fear where it felt like you have to be okay with living and walking the path that you want to walk and not walking those other paths and not being half in, half out. And even if it was delayed another two years, another year, another three years, this was just a small little speed bump on the way. As we were talking about before we hit record, I, um, I'm in Mexico City. And, and interestingly enough, and I feel almost like a little bit embarrassed to even compare myself to your story, but I went nomadic in 2018 and I, uh, I sold all my stuff. I had a two bedroom place in Santa Monica, sold all my stuff and moved into a carry on bag. And I was just traveling around the world, probably circled the globe a few times from that bag. Uh, granted I wasn't walking, but something that I could relate to is in your story, when you first set off on your adventure, you brought too much stuff. And I definitely brought too much stuff as well. Anyway, you cut to a year later, I'm, I'm, I'm using like a little backpack, like a backpack that a kid would take to school with them. And so my whole life fit in that. I learned how to hand wash my clothes and and um, yeah, and I did that for a few years until the pandemic hit. And then then once the music stopped playing, I didn't have a chair to go back to. So I just kind of ended up here in Mexico City. So that's how I started. That's how I ended up here. Must and, have felt uh, good to have it down to a backpack. Yeah, it did, man. It did. And, and you know, you mentioned a few times in your book, The World Walk, that, um, or actually, no, in interviews that I've heard in, in the researching this, that. Now, now that you're settled and have your places and stuff, you're not really that attached to anything. And I know, I know exactly how that feels, you know, like going so long without having anything or just realizing that everything you need is where you are, you know, and it's really your home is, is truly where your heart is. And, uh, so I, I know exactly how that feels and I'm, I'm just really looking forward to unpacking your journey. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think once you go to the extreme like we did, where you're living out of a backpack or living out of a baby carriage, you realize, oh, it, it really isn't the things that make you happy. It's right. all these other things around it. It's what you're doing. It's who you're with. It's where you're going, you know, what ideas you have in your head. Those are all the things that matter. And yeah, you realize, oh, like you can live out of a tent and be very happy. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, my, so my audience is familiar with my story, but your story is like my story times a thousand. So I'm, I'm <laughs> super excited. All right, so let's let's take it from the beginning. Let's talk about the early days growing up in your little bubble in New Jersey. Um, it's outside of Philly, right? This South yep. Jersey. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah, and it, I can even relate to that. Like I grew up in Alabama, had a really wonderful childhood. You know, um, I grew up in the 70s and just on the bike all day. There's no phones, no nothing, no way of communicating with anybody except, except for pay phones. And, uh, I, I just, I was telling a friend literally the other day before I read your book that one of my most profound moments as a kid was around nine years old. I, I had, there were six people in my family and I just always wanted, I craved my own space, never quite got it. And one day I just, I just walked out of my, my house walked to the corner, um, walked to my school, which was probably half a mile away. I know yours was walking distance as well. Kept walking. And then I got to the sort of the edge of the known universe for a nine-year-old, you know, like a couple miles away. And I kept walking and no one knew where I was. And I just kept going and going and going. It ended up at the, the city sort of shopping mall, which was maybe four or five miles away. And, and it was like, the scary adventure, but it was so exciting. And I felt so alive and I called my mom on the payphone, and she freaked out and <laughs> didn't understand how I ended up there. But that moment always stuck with me. And I think that probably was a, um, breadcrumb to what I was going to be doing later. Cause I've always kind of been that sort of solo independent traveler. So, 
Talk about your upbringing and, uh, and some of the things that you experienced that kind of was the foreshadowing of where, where things were going in your life. Yeah. It sounds like we had something similar between us. Uh, I remember doing like the same thing and my circle was probably even smaller. You know, I grew up in the little neighborhood by the river and I remember just going to the next, the next town over and it being like a whole new world and being lost and then having to try and figure out, okay, am I, do I turn right? Do I turn left? And then I don't even know, I don't remember how I got home, but I remember just crossing that threshold of this is new now. And it being like uh, an exhilaration kind of thing. And maybe, you know, maybe that's where it started from was that little bit of exploration. But yeah, so I grew up in, in Hand Township, a really safe little tiny town. Uh, grew up with loving parents, uh, a great sister. And I think, you know, when you grow up with such a loving community, a safe community, it's really good for you because you build a lot of confidence in yourself. But it also makes you very naive in a lot of ways once you actually go out into the world. Um, I don't know if you had the, a similar thing where once you are, you know, in a place that you don't know, you start realizing very heavily how much you don't know, and you get yourself into some situations which are less than savory, uh, less than safe. Um, but yeah, I, so I grew up in, you know, I grew up in this little town and my mom was an artist and she gave me a lot of her probably like perfectionism in a certain way. I never really thought of myself as a perfectionist, but speaking with my editor, he's like, oh, you're definitely a perfectionist. I remember listen, I listened to you talk over a sentence like a thousand times. So I guess I have that a little bit, at least with the art. Uh, but then my dad is a, you know, he goes to poker every week and people call him hippie uh, because he's just uh, like a flower child essentially. And he's very laid back. And so he gave me this real belief in humanity, this trust in humanity. And also I think like against the perfectionism, uh, a certain level of uh, relaxation and, and laid backness, uh, if that makes any sense. Um, so yeah, I like this good, uh, very blessed upbringing. And I think I got a good balance from my parents and, um, yeah, it was, it was very idyllic, as I say in the book, a very idyllic upbringing. What was the age gap between you and your sister? Four years. Okay. Yeah. So you, 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 you guys weren't that close then growing up because four years is quite a bit of time um, between siblings. It, it was and it wasn't. Um, I think we were in, we, in our block, we had you know, maybe 20 kids that were within a certain range. And so we all kind of hung out and played together. So I don't know, Lex and I were, were pretty close. We played, you know, uh, I was definitely, it took me a while uh, to realize that she had feelings. You know, when you're the older brother, you just kind of take your younger sister for granted. And, you know, you, you are definitely not as nice as you should be. Um, but I think we were close. We grew up, we, we played basketball together. We played hockey together. You know, we explored around the block and down at the river together. So, yeah, it was, I mean, and today we're very close, but yeah. Uh, yeah. What kind of student were you? I was a very good student until actually, I remember like the exact moment when I became not a good student was, uh, it was my junior year in high school or maybe it was sophomore year, sophomore year in high school. And I had a midterm the next day, I think growing up, I mean, I wasn't a very diligent student. My parents didn't really like, you have to, this is the most important thing pour your whole life into studying and making sure you get A's. It wasn't like that. It was more like, you know, this is important, but there are also, it's important to go play with your friends and, and do other things. So I had this balance in that way, but it wasn't, I wasn't very studious, but I got good grades. Um, I had math. I was great at, I was always very good at math. And then I had my, uh, it was like calculus or whatever it was midterm in a sophomore year the next day. And that night at like midnight, my sister, uh, essentially goes into a coma. It's like a diabetic coma. We didn't know she had diabetes. And so we spent the whole night at shop, the children's hospital, of Philadelphia. 
her sugar was at 600, 700, something like that. And I was up all night and I was so stressed out. My parents are stressed. You know, we don't know what's going to happen. And I went into the midterm at 7.45 the next day. And I asked the teacher, I said, hey, I was up all night. I really don't feel like taking this test. And she's like, it doesn't matter. You have to take it. And I sat there and I didn't answer any questions. And I walked out and she gave me a zero. And from then on, like for, for until senior year of college, basically, I was like, this is such a joke. Like this is, this is, I didn't believe in it at all. And I really checked out. And then it wasn't until senior year of college that I sort of rediscovered the joy of learning and the value of learning. And, you know, it's not to say I didn't get things out of school when there was classes I was interested in, I would, I would do great in them. Uh, like psychology and philosophy in college, I had great GPA, everything else. I'm like, I don't need this. I'm not worrying about this, <laughs> you know, whatever. Uh, so yeah, I remember like that exact moment where I went from being pretty uh, serious about school to really checking out. And it's just crazy how that one little, that one little day in my life uh, sort of flipped the switch for me for a while. Um, but yeah, now it's, you know, now I'm, I'm like working my way. I work my way through The Economist every week and, you know, uh, I read all the time. So it's very different now from what it was. Yeah. I mean, your book was really well written. And I, I heard you say that you were writing, I think, 5,000 words a day or something like that and going to the library and spending all day there. So kind of you were schooling yourself, it seems. Um, so I want to talk about that. And I also want to talk about the impact that your friend Anna Marie had on your earlier life. And, and um, man, one of my favorite movies that I was literally just writing about the other day was Dead Poet Society. Like that movie definitely made an impact on me, standing up on the desks and looking at the world from a different perspective. And just uh, Robin Williams, I feel like that and Goodwill Hunting were two of his most impactful roles. I mean, all of his roles, he's so he's such a good actor. Um, Patch Adams, but yeah, that one definitely left an impression because I was, I think I was in school around the time that that movie came out and I saw it. And there was no one that I could really relate to in Alabama on that level. And that's the same for you. Um, but that, that phrase carpe diem, you know, burned in, in my memory. And, um, and maybe that was, I didn't realize it at the time until I read it in your book, but maybe that was one of the sort of, uh, one of the breadcrumbs for me too, in doing the things that I do. Cause I, I think I adopted that mindset in a very intentional way ever since then. So anyway, for the listener who doesn't know your story, let's, let's catch them up with Anna Marie and Dead Poet Society and all the things. Yeah, so uh, Anne Marie was, like you said, this very influential person in my life, ultimately because of her death. But I knew her from growing up. We grew up around the block from each other. We were just the same, like, neighborhood friends. You know, we, when we walked to elementary school together, she was in the group. And when we walked to high school together, she was in the group. And in high school, you know, we are, we like, we pulled a, a junior prank. We had, you know, broke into the school and we were, we wanted to honey all the stairwells. And instead we just, we could, we couldn't buy enough honey. We didn't have money. So we soaked them. And she was in that group. You know, we were all, we were all very close. And I think the thing that differentiates Anne-Marie from my other friends and especially why her death was so impactful for me was that she was always the best among us. You know, she was the nicest, the, the nicest to the point that forever it drove me crazy that she would just never say anything like fun and never, never say anything that would get under someone's skin, never say anything that would just start a conversation because it was outlandish. She always took like the generous side of things and it drove me crazy, honestly. And I was always poking and prodding and trying to get her to say something that wasn't generous. And she never would. And so when she died, she died in this freak jet ski accident, uh, senior year, or like her going into her junior year, me going in my senior year. And first, our, first off, I'm 17. And so that is an influential time. And then she is such a nice person that that is influential as well. And it just left me 
her passing just left me in like this fog where I had known of death intellectually, of course, you know, it's an idea that is out there. And when you're young, you have to resolve it somehow. But I think I kind of just brushed it under the rug and you just continue on whatever train that you're on. And then when Anne-Marie passed, it was an emotional understanding that I didn't have before. And I realized that if Anne-Marie can die, who is better than me, then so can I, so can my friends, so can my family. And I knew that before, but I didn't really feel it. And it kind of destroyed my worldview, destroyed my philosophy. And I was left in this fog for months, really unsure of how to go about living when I knew death was over my shoulder. And then it wasn't until I found Dead Poet Society, you know, that great coming of age movie that gave me the first answers out of it, which was Carpe Diem, Seize the Day. And, you know, it's Were you not- just watching TV one day or how did you stumble across no, it? No, it was, I was in a speech and communications class and uh, a friend, we were sharing clips of our favorite movies and you had to like give a talk about them. And someone put up uh, Dead Poet Society and I had never been exposed to it before. And they only played a few clips. So I was like, oh my God, this movie looks incredible. I went home, I rented it. I watched it like every night for weeks, you know, trying to just totally absorb it. I remember that scene when they're standing in front of uh, the portraits of uh, the alumni who had passed and he's like, you're food for worm boys. Like that was like, oh my God, <laughs> just so just shaking me to the core. And, and then also Robin Williams is so inspiring in it. And the message is so pure and just, you know, relevant always uh, that I latched onto it. And then from there, from that carpe diem, I kind of took it like um, yes man, you know, and with Jim Carrey, where I was like, I'm just gonna say yes to everything. And that's what carpe diem became because I realized I have all this time in my day and I should be filling it with action. I should be filling it with growth. And so I was just signing up for everything. I was doing everything. And then gradually realized, oh, you can't actually do everything. You're, you're, there's only so much time in the day. And there's some things that you like more than others. And, you know, that's very obvious, but it's not until you sort of live that, that you realize, you know, you need to choose your path more specifically if you want to live this life that is meaningful to you. And so then I started really thinking about what do I value in life? What do I want out of my, you know, 50 years here, 70 years here, whatever, you know, 17 years, 27 years, whatever it is that I have here, what do I want? And when I really thought about it, you know, it was travel, be forced into adventure. That forced part was important because I was very shy and introverted when I was younger. And, and naive, you, you described yourself as being naive. Oh, incredibly naive. And, and you knew that, you realized it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, I mean, that's a part of it. It's like, how do I grow out of this? How do I go, you know, and I knew traveling was a way to get out of that. And I think the default, I think even then I knew like my default was probably like more of a homebody in a certain way or more, uh, or even as humans, you just want to be comfortable. And I wanted to have a life of adventure and I wanted something that would like force that upon me. So I had to live it. Uh, and then I wanted to understand the world. And so, you know, traveling was the ultimate answer. Initially, like I say in the book you read, it, initially I thought I was just gonna go backpacking with my cousin in Europe. And then I discovered these guys who had walked around the world before. And I was like, oh, this actually fulfills everything that I value. This is one idea that aligns with what I want out of life. And also I w had no money and walking was very affordable. And so that's where he came. Hey, so a lot of you all have been reaching out with your guest suggestions. And look, I appreciate it, I do. And to help make it easier for those guests to say yes to my invitation, I need you to subscribe to this channel. Just hit the subscribe button below, and that's literally the best way to help me get you that guest on my podcast. All right. Thank you so much for helping out and back to the show. You said you've been reading blogs and stuff. Um, I imagine you probably read about the Appalachian Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, um, you know, people who walked across the country. Why wasn't that enough? Why, why, what was it about Carl Bushby and, and, and Steve Newman that, that kind of piqued your interest to, to go what most people would consider to be really extreme. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was. I, I, I think what it stemmed from was I had this people to people exchange when I was 16 and I went over to England, Ireland and Wales for a month. And that was just enough to tell me there's more outside of America that I wanted to know. And it, it wasn't like this, you know, adventure where I you know I'm out in the wilderness. It was like I stayed with some families in Ireland and in Wales and it was very comfortable, but it gave me a viewpoint that there are other viewpoints that I wanted to learn about and that I wanted to see. And so the world walk, uh, why it wasn't just walking across America or hiking to AT, uh, was really because I wanted to see all these different viewpoints. And I wanted to really, I mean, it, I mean, like I said, I wanted to understand the world. That was a fundamental part of, of the world walk was it wasn't, it wasn't just about the adventure. It was about, I want to be on the ground. I want to be somewhere I don't understand and figuring it out along the way. Were you someone at the time who always followed through on the things that they said they were going to do, or did you not have a whole lot of evidence for that? Cause I know you made it public in your class and you kind of said that at that time it locked you in, but did it really lock you in or did that come later? I no, it, it did. I remember, I remember vividly giving that speech still and you know, like I said, I was pretty shy when I was younger mm -hmm. and I grew up in this big family and, you know, in a certain way that gave me a lot of confidence, like later in life, I think growing up in the big family and, you know, but it also made me very reluctant to speak up because if your idea wasn't on point, they would be like, we're just going to shred this thing. Oh, this is what Tom thinks. Let's all rip on it and laugh about it or whatever else. And, you know, now it's more comfortable and you know, you can say stuff or, you know, talk about things and, and, you know, just for the joke of it or whatever. But when I was younger, I was very intimidated by these big family parties. And so I, I do think I always had a little bit of me where it's like, you only say something if you really believe in it, if you really mean it. And so I think I, I did always have some of that. Don't say it unless you're going to do it kind of thing. You start to, you have the plan, but you need to make some money, obviously. And uh, you start doing the solar panel stuff. And th this part of the story kind of reminds me of the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Have you seen this? Yeah, but I mean, a long time ago. Yeah, it's an old black, black and white. And, uh, black and white, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. Um, the guy, the main character, wants to go to see the world. And, but. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. His, his dad has a heart attack and he's, you know, he's got to stay around in the small town where he is to kind of take over the family business. So it's like every time he thinks he's going to get out, something happens. And so you find out that your parents are underwater in their, in their house and they, they actually need you to help contribute, <laughs> you know, and spend some of the money you've been saving up. So that's a really interesting dilemma because again, they've been very good to you. They've, you know, nurtured you and created this really safe space. And, and so I guess you feel obligated to some extent to you know, help them out, even though you have this plan now that you, that you kind of hatched at 17 years old, but it didn't, it, you know, you weren't going to get started right away. So just talk a little bit about your mentality then. And I think for anybody listening to this, who wants to take on a big project, you know, they may see something like that as a reason not to, not to follow through, but you kind of, you mentioned how you, um, ha actually having the larger plan helped you to navigate smaller inconveniences like that a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think the, to, to go on how you ended it, the larger thing, having a larger plan, uh, just helps you minimize smaller struggles. And that really bore out specifically in the walk itself. I mean, it becomes a very physical, visceral thing where you're crossing these mountains. And if you think about if all I'm going to do is cross one mountain, you're like, this is a mountain, this is crazy. But if you're walking the Andes in Colombia and your goal was to get down to the bottom of South America, like this is just one little bump and, you know, it's just one day in, in, in this larger journey. And it becomes, the mountain becomes actually a very small thing in this grander scale. And so I think there's something similar with, you know, my parents losing their house. Ultimately, they lost their house anyway. But at the time, I had already been thinking about the World Walk and I'd been so focused on the World Walk for you know, seven years, six years, something like that, that when this came up, you know, it's, it was unfortunate. And I really, you know, was bummed that I had to give away, you know, tens of thousands of dollars that I had saved 
very diligently by living at home. Uh, but also it was like, I was living at home and I had this good job because of my dad who was a solar developer. And so it wasn't like I had purely made the money on my own. I didn't feel like that. And, you know, like you said, they, they gave me this great upbringing and I still feel indebted to them and family is very important to me. And so there was, even though it was in a certain way, you know, it's a bummer that the walk was delayed another two years or so because of that. In my mind, I remember when my mom asked for, you know, a few thousand dollars to keep the house. I was like, yeah, all right, whatever. I'm like, how much do you need? You know, it's, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be working this job that's paying very well. I'm happy to help out in that way. And I knew still, even then, I was going to walk around the world. I was going to give it my best shot. And even if it was delayed another two years, another year, another three years, you know, this was just a small little speed bump on the way. Yeah, it's interesting because the whole trip would take you, I guess, you had estimated seven or eight years. And so I guess, you know, waiting another year or two is not the end of the world. And like a six month long Pacific Crest Trail trip, which is like, okay, well, I need to wait another couple months or whatever the case is. Um, so yeah, you would work a few months on, a few months off. And your plan, your original plan was to save up enough for the first couple of years and then potentially get a sponsor. And this really cool thing happens when you go to collect your, to get a cart made um, that you didn't really anticipate. Talk, talk a little bit about that. Cause I think this is something that I think happens when anyone puts themselves out there, you get this initial sort of stroke of luck. It actually reminded me of the alchemist a little bit. Um, oh yeah. We got the media coverage and stuff like that. So just talk about how that happened. Yeah. So uh, early on, you know, I, the, the world walk was just this idea in my head for a long time. And then by the time I reached 24, I was working the solar panel job and it paid really well. But I also saw how these guys I was working with, their bodies would just get destroyed. And, you know, you're working 12, 14 hour days and eventually like that adds up. And so I told myself at 24, I'm going to quit this job by the time I turn 25, just arbitrarily. I just knew I couldn't do this forever and I needed to force myself into some action. And so I quit the job at 25 and then I'm like, okay, in a year I'm going to be in the walk. And so then really I started more actively, not just behind the scenes, saving money, living at home kind of thing. I started more actively, okay, how do I put together a beginning of the walk? And so I, the first thing I did was order this bike carriage that I could attach to my belt. I thought, and I would pull all my things because that's what Carl Busby did. He was pushing this baby car or pushing this carriage. And so, all right, this seems like it's a good way to carry all my things, save my back. And so I went to a local maker space called the factory workers. And when I went over there, I just pull up front in my junky $100 Jetta that I bought from a family friend. And I say, Hey, I have this, this guy is walking out front. I say, Hey, do you know anyone? Uh, at the factory workers and say, yeah, I own the place. I go, oh, well, this is very serendipitous. Uh, I have this cart. I'm going to do this thing. I didn't tell him I was going to walk around the world right away. Cause that just sounds insane. I say, yeah, I have this cart. I was wondering if you could just modify it essentially. He's like, well, it's aluminum. It's a difficult thing to modify. You know, what do you want? What do you want it for? And so this is the first person that I actually told outside of my immediate circle that hey, I'm, gonna, I'm planning on doing this insane thing, walking around the world. Do you believe me? <laughs> you know? And so I tell him this and he's like, yeah, okay. Like, I don't know what it was about me, but he pretty much like didn't question it. He's like, yeah, it seemed like this is something that he would do. And so, uh, right away, this guy, Tom Marchetti says, this card isn't going to work for you, but I'll build you something. And you know, he's a man about town and he knows all these people. I'll introduce you to some people, maybe get you a sponsor. And we'll throw a fundraiser for you and we'll get you some media coverage. And so it was really that first introduction to Tom that snowballed basically like the viability of the walk. You know, I had money saved that I thought I could bleed out living on rice and beans for years. And I was willing to go on that savings, but Tom really made it much more comfortable, much more possible because he, he made this first card for me. He threw the fundraiser. He got me in the inquirer and an NJ pen. And that led to Philadelphia sign, this local company discovering 
my story and they knew Emory and they were just opening an international branch. And so it was really fortunate that kind of our stars aligned, our paths aligned, and they decided to give me a little bit of money every week and, and donate into Emory and my friend Shannon's scholarship funds. And it was from that like first stepping out of myself and really trying to put my plans together and, and allowing them out into the world that things started moving. And it's very easy, I think, to have an idea in your head and hold on to it and wait for everything to be perfect before beginning. But once you actually start taking physical steps towards that goal, people get interested and they want to help you. And maybe it's just the conversations you have. And someone says, oh, I know someone who does this. I know someone who does this. And, you know, not every path is going to work out. Not every conversation is going to work out. But if you have 100 conversations and one of them is helpful, it's better than zero conversations because none of them will be helpful. And so that for me just really bore out where once I started putting myself out there and saying, hey, I'm actually going to walk around the world. I'm leaving the day before I turn 26. People are like, I, I could get behind that. How can I help? I, I was working these tables. I was working at two different restaurants. And tour, as I approached the walk, I would go, I would meet people who would come in and they knew my parents or they knew my sister, whatever it was. And I'd you know, open the check and there'd be a hundred dollars in there. And it's like, best of luck on your world walk. You know, and it's like, people want to get behind you if you have a big dream and if they believe you're going to do it. Yeah, I think it kind of inspires people in ways that, you know, they may, may remind them of the things that they didn't do. And so they want, they want to kind of live vicariously through you. And so you get ready to embark on this journey. Your mom tells you, don't be an idiot. Your dad tells you, you know, there are friendly people out there, you know, and connect with people. Um, and the, the custom made cart that you had ends up not being the right one for the duration of the journey. I, I was thinking about that when I first heard about it and, um, you know, you mentioned a couple of times the tires going flat and things and I, you know, there are these like city bikes in various cities in New York and where I am in Mexico city. And one thing they do is they have, I always wonder like, how do they manage the flat tires and stuff And it? And what I, what I think they do is they have tires that are all rubber, like you don't have to inflate at all. And so I was just curious, like talk a little bit about what kind of design you felt you would need for this. And at this time you're completely by yourself. You don't have your dog yet. Um, but what do you think you need and what do you actually end up requiring? Well, the, the card that Tom built me was basically like a heavy duty ice cream cart, essentially. Mm -hmm. It weighed it on, it had diamond steel on the bottom. His I intentions were good though. <laughs> but the intentions were good, but oh my God, this thing weighed so much. And it was too low for me, really. I'm pretty tall. And so pushing it took a lot of effort. And it had run flat tires at the time. And we're both thinking, hey, this is a great idea because then you'll never need to replace the tires. But Things are run. What's a run flat tire? Basically, that it's just it's just plastic and rubber, and so there's no, nothing inflatable about it. Uh, but the thing about the run flat tires was like the axle was all plastic, and the cart weighed so much that a few days in the walk, I tilted it just a little bit. All the weight went onto the tire, and the thing just like exploded. It was just like, no, nope, we can't do this anymore. And the the uh, my sponsor drove out uh, a different tire, and I replaced them, but. You know, at the time I was thinking, like you were saying earlier, you need all these things and I need to be ready for any situation. And I brought a camp table and a camp chair and I brought like, like the, uh, an inflatable pillow. And pretty quickly as you go, especially when you're pushing up these hills every day with this massive ice cream cart, essentially, that weighs like everything in total probably weighed like 120 pounds. All I'm thinking about is what can I get rid of? What do I not need? Every step is is a consideration of that weight. And so gradually, like, okay, I, I don't need this. I don't need this. And it becomes this game of how critical is this thing and how much does it weigh? Like in the sense of later on, I carried this axle, a spare axle. It's pretty small, you know, just four inches or something like that. And probably I will never need it. But if I'm out there and the axle does break, it's not something that I can replace. And so it's like, I held on to that because if something goes wrong, you got to have it. There's no way you can fix it. And it weighed a good amount, but you know, 
you need it when things go wrong. So I was always weighing it in, in that sense. And over the first month or so, I cut like half of my things, maybe more than half of the things I had. And looking back, like the camp table and the camp chair, it's like, get real. That's just, <laughs> that is like so unnecessary. You're walking around the world. You don't need to carry that. Uh, ultimately, I switched out Tom's cart for a Thule baby carriage. And they have so much engineering behind the Thule. You know, those things are tested on thousands, hundreds of thousands of man hours. And I used three of them over my walk and they were fantastic. And the idea behind carrying my things in a cart versus a backpack was a few things. I mean, first, I just hated carrying a backpack that weighed a ton. I went hiking for a few days before the walk, you know, 10 days with a friend. I was like, this sucks. I don't want to, I don't want to be carrying 50, 60 pounds on my back all the time. I'm too tall. It's going to destroy my spine. So I knew I wanted to push my things, but then also, especially when I got Savannah later on, it allowed me to carry some luxuries that I wouldn't be able to if I had uh, a backpack. And then it also gave me more flexibility of food and water when I was in areas where it was desert or, you know, there was nothing around for four or five days. Uh, so yeah, ultimately the cart, I'm very glad I pushed a cart. I looked crazy pushing the cart through all these places. I remember, I remember very specifically in, in uh, Peru, I'm walking through the desert in the north and there's this little village on the side of the road and there's maybe like 10 people standing by uh, a fruit stand. And I'm walking by, like, it, uh, this is out of nowhere. I'm in the desert and I'm just walking down the road with a baby carriage or sunscreen on my face with a dog on the leash. And I'm looking over and they're all just staring at me and their head is growling. And it's all like, this must look so insane that this tall, gangly white guy is passing through here with a baby carriage and a cart. But well, there I am. Uh, so it definitely looked insane, uh, but it afforded me a lot of luxuries and, and it saved my back. That's where you saw the little placard with Carl, right? Carl's uh, yeah. in that desert, in that restaurant. It was surprisingly crowded for how desolate it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So I was in that, I go, whoa, this house is placed in fact right now. You know nowhere. <laughs> um, so, guys, man, there's so many, so many questions I have about this. But had you been a big walker prior to embarking upon this journey? Maybe. I mean, I walked to school every day for basically my entire life. Uh, I would wa always walk with a friend. And uh, in, in high school, I walked with Fitz. He was like prominently featured in the book and gave me a lot of good advice. But I think the parallel between walking around the world and my like upbringing wasn't necessarily that I loved walking, but I did always love like being out there. And I used to, in high school, I just felt this need sometimes to get away. And so I'd be like 10 o'clock at night and I would go for a nine mile run. And I didn't like running. I still don't like running, but I just felt this urge to be out with my own thoughts, feel like I have the world to myself. And so I think that is probably the closer parallel to uh, the world walk and my upbringing is, is that, is that innate need to kind of be out exploring and, and feel like I'm discovering something. Yeah. I feel like the idea of it, especially as a young person, um, who pretty much grew up in a bubble, it's, it's gotta be akin to like, you know, going to the moon, right? Like you don't even know what it's going to feel like to be in space and you're trying to go to the moon. And so initially you get blisters, you realize that the, the, handle is too cold for the time of year. It starts raining the first couple of days. Well, so talk a, a little bit about what, what you learn about just walking, about navigating the weather that you're in. Is there a certain way you, you have to walk in order to avoid a blister or in order to avoid your back pain or, you know, things like that? Because I, I walk I've been walking about 11 and a half miles a day for about three or four years. And I did the math once and it's like, oh, I could have walked across America three times. You know, if you do, if you do 10,500 steps a day for a year, you walk across America, you walk 3000 miles. So, but you know, I have 
And as a nomad, I've had one pair of shoes and my shoes always wear out in the same way because I, I yeah. supinate. So my heels wear out first. I have the same cracks, except I, I reorder the same pair of shoes again and again and again. Same cracks, dust falls in the same place. So I've noticed these patterns in the way I walk and in how I need to walk. I've gotten soles for these shoes. So talk a little bit about what you noticed uh, initially in those first few weeks about how to walk so that you don't wear yourself out. Yeah, uh, walking long-term, like walking over extended periods is different than just walking downtown. It, it takes a bigger toll on your body. I think that was the first thing I realized was that I was an athlete my whole life. Oh, I can handle this. That's what I thought. And then once you're walking 15 miles a day, your body is just not ready for it. It does not have the muscles built up that it needs to. It's not flexible in the way that it should be. And also you need good shoes. I would say that's the main thing. You need good shoes and you need good socks, wool socks in particular, because you're going to be sweating and your feet will be moving. And so the shoes and the socks took a lot of trial and error, but the other thing I realized when I, when I first got out there and was walking, and again, this is probably pretty obvious, but you're just exposed all the time. You are out in the elements. And so you need to be ready for the elements whenever they turn, whenever a rainstorm passes, whenever it gets very hot the next day, whatever it is. Uh, so I think it became more about, first off, like getting my body up to gear, it just took a month. I just needed a month to, you know, get my legs and my hip flexors strong enough. I needed to learn how to stretch properly every night. So I felt okay the next day. What did that look like, your stretching routine? It was, it was really simple, uh, but I had to do it. You know, I had to, the, the hamstrings and then the hip flexors and then the quads. And like, I wouldn't do much. It took me you know, probably three minutes, something so like that. Every forward fold and like a pigeon pose and that kind yeah, of the thing. Pigeon pose. Yeah. The pigeon pose. And then yeah, the forward fold and then just, just putting the, you know, uh, the leg under me for the, for the quad, whatever that would be. And that was it. Uh, and a lot of that was for like the back too, was for the lower back and the upper back pushing the cart. Uh, but the hip flexors in particular, I mean, they were, they would get really tight in that first month, but so I need to figure out the, the physical things. And then it was really about getting the gear right and realizing you need, you need the right things to weather whatever is going to pass. And one of the, the small things in the beginning, which I never thought about, was just waterproof gloves. And if you didn't have waterproof gloves in, in the April rain or the May rain, man, my hands were just like cramping like crazy. And, and so, yeah, I mean, the beginning, the beginning of the walk-in, just a lot of trial and error and it's getting the right gear and uh yeah learn how to stretch and and just letting your body adjust you would improvise them imagine you get like plastic grocery bags or something for your work. yeah i did that i did that for my shoes the plastic yeah i did that until i got the right waterproof and the gore-tex i realized is not actually waterproof it's pretty water resistant but you actually need i need it like rubber sheaves for the rain yeah, yeah. and and so did you learn that you needed to walk um on the opposite side of the street so you could see the traffic coming or how, how cause, that, cause people take, I, I, th I think in outside of America, it, areas are more conducive to walking. People surprisingly, America is not very conducive to walking cause no one ever walks anywhere. So what did you kind of learn about how to sort of navigate streets so that you didn't get hit? And, and did you, were you listening to things or did you intentionally not listen? to stuff while you were walking so you could hear like rattlesnakes or cars coming or things like that. In the beginning, I listened to things less probably because it was more stressful. I wanted to feel the surroundings more, but I definitely learned, you know, you walk uh, against the traffic and there's times that came in use. I remember in Mexico, a car, you know, almost hit me and I like slid off the side of the road, like as it slammed on its brakes uh, and, you know, probably would have hit me if I was going in the other direction. And then the roads, it's kind of like a Goldilocks thing with the roads, you know, because I have the car, I'm not walking trails. And so you need to find one that is direct, but not so big that it's stressful and loud and you're just hating your life all day. We also don't want one that's so small that you're spending all day walking two, three miles in reality. So it's finding the right road. Um, and then 
Yeah, and then it was uh, it, it was finding a place to camp was a difficult thing towards the end of the day as well. And you know that's like a you know that's a consideration when you're out there walking in these places is that okay if I walk this main road then it's going to bring me to a town and you know I'm there I'm I'm going to walk in the darkness to find a place to sleep. Maybe I should walk this little bit smaller road towards the end of the day so I can find a patch of woods to to get away and. Uh, but I also do agree with you that like America, it's really odd because America has like more roads, I feel like than anywhere else. And it should be great walking because we have the, all this infrastructure and it's so big, but there's just cars everywhere. There's other countries you go to where they only have a few roads, but you almost never see cars <laughs> or there's a ton of roads and there really are no cars. Uh, and then, like you said, like I had so many people on, <laughs> on my, on the, on the second leg when I walked across the U.S., for the end, for the last section, I had so many people stop and give me money because they thought I was homeless. It was like, this guy's outside walking. He has to be homeless. This guy's, oh, he's, he's, a, he's got a tough off. And I'm like, I'm living a great life, but thank you for the hundred dollars. That's really nice of you. Um, yeah, but yeah, people in America just don't walk. And, and for camping at night, Americans are never out at night. They're inside watching TV. So you can sleep really well and you can camp pretty much anywhere in America and probably no one's going to find you because they're inside. And that's not the case for every country. Yeah. You said you discovered the churches as a, as a kind of a safe space to, to camp. So Bushby didn't, didn't mention like where he was sleeping or give tips for things like that when you studied this before you left? No, uh, I talked to him before I left. Uh, and he was really like, his advice was, like you got to document everything that that's what he said he regretted not doing and, and regretted not using social media more. So that was like his primary advice for me. And I didn't ask him too much about like the logistics. I think before beginning, I didn't really know what the problems were that I would be facing. So you read about certain things and you read about camping and you read about long distance walking, but it's not really until you're on the ground doing it that the problems crop up and you need to solve them, the, the real problems. And uh, so, no, I didn't actually get from Bushby. I don't think I got like any applicable advice really besides Instagram. <laughs> and he's still out there. I, I, I was looking at his stuff today and, and I guess he had yeah. some visa issues with Russia or something like that. So yeah, he just, like he's his landing across the Caspian. Exactly. He's yeah. doing it without taking any boats or anything like that, which is pretty, pretty remarkable. Oh yeah. He dude. swam across the, the um, Bering Strait, right? Yeah. Swam across the Bering Strait. No, he's, he's, the world walking badass for sure. No one else like him. <laughs> I love it. So you ended up, you know, I saw this movie, The Life of Pi, with the kid in the boat with the tiger. And obviously it presents lots of drama in that story. And at the end of the story, the boy admits that if he hadn't had this scary, ferocious tiger in the boat, he probably wouldn't have survived being, um, uh, stranded out at sea for, for many, many months. And so you kind of decided to adopt a, a puppy, um, during the, in the middle of this walk, which would obviously introduce a lot of obstacles that someone may think is unnecessary, but it ended up being probably the best thing you did in the whole experience. So just to share a little bit about, about your thinking around. Yeah adopting a puppy, especially those first few days when, when, when he wouldn't walk, he was scared of the cars and that must've yeah. made you think, oh my God, this is the biggest mistake ever. Yeah. She was scared of cars. She was adopted on the side of a high or found on the side of a highway and had this paralyzing, really paralyzing fear of cars where if she even heard a car, she wouldn't move. And I was walking roads all the time. And I'm thinking, oh my, this is the worst dog I possibly could have adopted for what I plan to do because she's just going to be frozen all the time. But so I walked four months, a little over four months on my own, met a couple strange characters and, and just not sleeping that well, uh, camping in whatever place I was camping. And, and the thought was always there that, man, it would be nice to have a dog that could listen while I slept or sense pe things about people that maybe I wouldn't sense. And so when I got to Austin, Texas, I'm at my cousin's house and the first day I think, you know, I'm just going to go to this, this adoption center and, you know, you know, hang out with some dogs. I didn't think I was going to adopt any, any dogs. Spent a few hours there. Right as I'm about to leave, they bring out Sedana, who's just a puppy. And, you know, I adopt her. 
thinking that, okay, this is insane to adopt a puppy, but also in the same token, if I adopt a puppy versus an older dog, they won't have any behavioral issues. The only night, the only life they will know is walking. And so I thought, okay, if I can just get through these first few months, which are going to be difficult and I don't know what I'm doing. My parents had a dog, but I didn't train it. And I'm still want it, wanting to walk 24 miles a day. And then I'm going to be entering Mexico and that has its own problems and, and challenges that I'm going to be facing. But if I can just get the, through those first few months training this dog, the rest of it will be so much easier. And so I adopted Savannah and yeah, that first month or so was so stressful and I just did not know how to train her. And I really prioritized my mileage. I always had this anxiety that I needed to walk 24 miles a day, especially for the first two years. And it was inescapable and it, it was useful because it drove me forward and it got me to always be moving. But at that time when I had Savannah, it's like, I just didn't have time in the day. I didn't have energy initially to train her. And then I spoke with my mom, which is like in the book, this whole scene, I, I spoke with my mom and she's like, you got to change your priorities right now. You know, it's going to take time to train Savannah. So that's where you need to get her right before you can enter Mexico and expect to walk 24 miles a day in Mexico. And so then I started spending like three hours a day in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, training her. And pretty quickly, once I was training her pretty quickly, she was like, all right, I'm down with this life. This works. You know, we're walking every day. I want to walk already. I have a lot of energy. Uh, she just had to get used to the leash. She had to get used to the cars going by and, and just being exposed to that. Um, I was worried initially that she wouldn't have any fear of cars. You know, I was worried that she would go into the street uh, and I would work out that fear so much that it would end up getting her killed. But you know, that wasn't the case. I always had her on leash and, and gradually, you know, she became in, insanely well-trained. She was a working dog. And when we were walking towards the end, she would have her ear brushing against my calf for eight hours a day. And it was only when I said, okay, that she would go off. Uh, so when we were going, she was, she became a real working dog. But yeah, at the beginning, it was like, um, what did I do? This is a horrible decision getting this puppy. <laughs> so 20, you said 24 miles a day. That's about what, seven, eight hours of walking a day. So talk, take us through a typical day, like just walking, just walking around. What, what times you wake up, what times you start walking, what were your meal times like, um, what were your bed times like? It depends on a few things. Depends on how the campsite is that I'm at. If I'm in a campsite that I'm on someone else's land, maybe I'm up early. I'm up at five o'clock breaking camp and I'm off the land as quickly as I can leaving no trace. And that wasn't all the time, but sometimes you even sleep close to, you know, where someone's living. I wanted to get out of there. If I had a peaceful campsite and the days are longer, then maybe I sleep in a little bit until, you know, seven, eight o'clock, something like that. I, I generally liked being packed before eight o'clock, kind of regardless of whatever the weather was or, or the length of the days. I, I felt like if I could get in a good four hours of walking by noon, then the second half of the day would be pretty relaxed. And I could find a place to sleep easier without feeling like I needed to really push on and get extra miles. Uh, so probably I'm waking up at like seven o'clock, something like that on most days. Again, depends on the length of the day, depends on the weather. Um, and then ideally I, I had camped approximately one hour walk from a town or from a shop and I would walk one hour and then, then I would get a, a coffee, a breakfast, something like that. If that wasn't there, I'm having granola and peanut butter in the morning and I'm having a little, make a little coffee, which I didn't do that often because then I also felt like I was wasting time. Other times I'd just throw back a caffeine pill or something and that would get me going. And then I would walk probably three hours, find somewhere for lunch. If not making peanut butter jellies, and packing in whatever food I have on me, more granola, nuts, something like that. What about like showering, going to the bathroom, stuff like that? At what point in your day were you planning to do things like that? And where would you go to Walmarts in the States and find showers and stuff? Uh, I wouldn't. Uh, I would like use a hose probably at churches that I did that a lot in the U.S. But I only really did that in the U.S. because 
The U.S. has a lot of spigots that's not common in other countries. And there's just so many churches as well, which is also not common in other countries. So in the U.S., I really relied on churches to shower and, and for places to camp. In other countries, like when I got into Mexico, I started using baby wipes um, and or I would like jump in a river or something like that. But it was only once every few days, probably that I would really get clean. But day to day before bed every night, I would use baby wipes. And if I didn't, then you really start getting rashes and you start feeling real gross, uh, especially with sunscreen on and everything like that and the sweat. Uh, so I use baby wipes uh, at night and then, you know, going to the bathroom, it's like, you just got to get creative and, uh, you know, you find places to go to the bathroom when you need to go to the bathroom. Did you um, wash your clothes regularly or did you have a lot of, like a few different t-shirt t-shirt changes? So one every three days you'd wash one and then wear two days later and that kind of thing? Uh, w wash the socks all the time. You had to have clean socks, got to have clean underwear. The shirts I had uh, were the Lululemon with the silver thread in them. So they never smelled, which was really nice. And they could get pretty dirty without, you know, like totally, you know, reeking. And so I would, I would wash it whenever I could kind of thing, but I could wear the shirt for a few days. And, and through Central America, it was so hot. Basically, I just wore one shirt the entire time. I would, by the end, by the time I was in uh, Panama City, I tried to take off the shirt and it just like disintegrated because I'd sweat into it for whatever, five months, six months, something like that. I also gradually just broke down. Uh, but yeah, like logistically with uh, the laundry, uh, I had a bag, I had a laundry bag, you know, I just separate the dirty clothes basically. And then when I got to a river, if I stayed at a hotel for some reason, I would use laundromat. But if I got to a river, you know, squirt some soap in there, put a little soap in there, scrub them clean. And, and that was it. Uh, just try and keep as clean as you could. And you had a budget of about, was it 14,000 a year? So the Philadelphia signs your sponsor, how would that work? They just put the money into your checking account and you would just like, uh, use your credit card and stuff whenever you needed to stay somewhere or buy something or. Yeah, like yeah, exactly. It's just in the, in, in the, in the credit account. And, you know, today every country pretty much has ATMs and and a lot of them were adopting like contactless payment or digital payment before even the U.S. was. Uh, so yeah, it was that was really no problem uh, getting cash wherever I was and using just a debit card. Was that sufficient? Well, once you got really into it, like got down into Central America, did you realize, okay, I think this I could do this, or do you feel like uh, I need to stretch it out? I need to stretch the dollar. I lived especially frugally those first two years, uh, mm -hmm. in part because I felt that like insatiable need to prove myself. And so I would walk 24 miles every day those first couple of years. And I rarely got a hotel room. I think there was times I, I would just go months without a hotel room. And so I lived really frugally then. And, and then in South America, it was cheaper even than Central America. The hotels were like seven bucks. The more expensive ones were like 20 bucks, something like that. So I started getting hotels a little more often, but also I was just in the desert and I wouldn't spend any money for half the year in the desert, basically. So the 14,000 was definitely enough. It wasn't until I got to Europe and that it wasn't. And so I started the Patreon and was like, all right, I can't actually live on 14,000 a year here. Were you, um, Recording your journey with a blog or on your social media, like what, what kind of cadence did you find work well and how engaged were people, um, outside of like your friend circle or, or your family? So I was blogging every week mm -hmm. and before blogging, I had really discovered the joy of writing, but I always written in the third person or omnipresent point of view uh, for these really bad science fiction novels that I love to write. And I had never written in the first person. And so when I started these blogs initially, they were okay, I guess, but I would write them every week and gradually I kind of like develop my voice and my perspective. But also like in the beginning, Everything was so new and there was so much conflict, whether it was internal, external, just because I didn't know what I was doing, that it was really easy to write a blog post every week. So I did that as much for myself as for the people following me. And there was pretty good uh, engagement on that. 
And then I also started uh, an Instagram page and I never had social media before the walk. And, but I had this fundraiser to help pay off the student loans that Tom Marchetti helped set up and had in the factory workers. And all these people came and donated money and helped me pay off my student loans. And so I felt, okay, like I'm indebted to these people. They need to have the opportunity to come along the walk with me. And so then I started the Instagram page and that was really where I, I like established a rhythm and I would post every day pretty much that I could. And initially it was very minimal, you know, photo and just small caption. I walked this many miles. This is what day it is. And then gradually as you know, the years went on, uh, and I was able to, I think, better parse the emotions I was, I was feeling, the subtleties and the emotions I was feeling from day to day. And then also the subtleties and differences between one place to the next place that the Instagram and those daily posts became really useful records and, and uh, like communiques back to the world where I go, okay, like this is the subtle gradation of Peru. And this is the subtle gradation of walking across the desert and slowly losing my mind and, you know, really being able to parse atom by atom, these differences. And so I came to really enjoy Instagram a lot. You know, you still feel the pressure that like you have to post to it and it kind of demands a lot of you in a certain way, but it was also maintainable enough. And the lift was small enough that I just needed to take one good photo a day at the time and then get my thoughts down. And I could do that while walking eight hours a day. I tried videoing for a little bit and it's just so demanding. And also I really hated how it took me out of the moment. The photograph, I never really was out of the moment. I could still be in, I could take the photo and enjoy the, and enjoy what I was seeing, enjoy the people, whatever it was, and still be in it. But when I was doing the videos, which I tried, I tried for years, honestly, like I, people love this, you, but then I would do it. And I was like, this is just taking me out of it. And, and the point of the world walk was to, you know, be immersed in the world. It wasn't to like produce some content for people. Uh, so I think the Instagram was a sweet spot and people connected with it. And I had a few Reddit AMAs pretty early on. The first Reddit AMA that I had was in Texas right after I adopted Sedana. <laughs> and people were not happy. They're like, you're gonna leave this dog somewhere. You're gonna leave her in Mexico. This is so irresponsible. Like, I'm not going to leave this dog somewhere like, you know, and also it turned out like the bureaucratic side of getting a dog across the border was so easy. It's like a rabies vax and health certificate. Most of the countries didn't even acknowledge her because there's already strays walking across. And it's like, they don't care. Um, but yeah, I think, I think pretty on, uh, pretty early on, I got a, a decent following from people outside of my immediate circle that were invested in, you know, Savannah, especially. <laughs> hey, really quickly. If you like this content or if you don't like it, let me know down in the comments because your likes and comments are going to help me learn what you want more of. And then that way I can keep bringing you the good stuff. All right. Thanks so much for your feedback and back to the show. When you were plotting your path, right? Now that you're like a year into it, was it more advantageous for you and your mission to go through big cities to like plan, okay, I'm going to go through Buenos Aires. I'm going to go through Santiago. Or did you, was it more advantageous to kind of take the, the more rural path? And then also my, my, my next question, which is kind of a different question, but I, maybe it relates. You're a young man, you're tall, you're handsome, right? you got this incredible story, which you would sometimes tell people to kind of help you you know, get resources or, Hey, I'm staying here, but I'm, I'm walking. I've just come from New Jersey. Um, and you had broken up with your girlfriend prior to, to embarking upon this journey, which was a big sacrifice, but obviously, you know, you're a straight, you know, attractive male, white guy, you know, uh, what was, were you interested in, in sort of hooking up? Obviously you were going to have a relationship with anyone because you're moving on. But what was, how did you navigate your, your, your hormones, your, your testosterone? Um, and did that dictate where you went? Like if I go to Buenos Aires and, and post up there for a few weeks or a week, I can kind of get some action going and then I'll move on. And well, let's just keep it, let's just be honest. Like, what was that situation like for you? The first two years, not at all, honestly. I, <laughs> you're I, I, you're I, I, think, I think like you underestimate how 
insanely demanding walking Central America is. <laughs> I mean, it's like a fire hose of information and challenges every day. And so I didn't manage in real time. Oh my gosh. I remember going through these cities and thinking I am using 100% of my brain. Like my brain is absolutely maxed out and I can't wait to get out of the city so that I can just relax a little bit. So I didn't really have space for anything else. There was maybe times like when I stopped in Lima or, or, um, or, uh, Montevideo for like a month where I was with cousins or with friends, then I sort of had the space, but I never like decided my route as so, all right, because it takes so much effort to get anywhere. It's like, I want to hook up with someone. I'm going to go walk to this big city and then set up there. And this is going to be really stressful walking into the city. Like, you know, it didn't seem worth it. But if I was somewhere and I had time and it was serendipitous and it just kind of worked out, then maybe. But I also generally avoided the capital cities and the bigger cities because they're just really stressful to walk through, especially in the Americas. They're really chaotic really busy. And especially for me at that time when I just knew less of the world and less how to handle myself in the world. So generally, I mean, even for Paris, I was kind of scarred from the first two years of the walk. When I got to Europe, I, I had this real fear of walking through these bigger cities because you get people, your eyes are on you and you're navigating the curves and, and you, it's easier to take wrong turns. And there's all these little things that you really have to have your, like to be on point for. And so even for Paris, I walked around Paris and it would have been great to, you know, go through there in hindsight, maybe I should have, but the appeal of walking, you know, country roads through, you know, the, the French countryside was much more appealing for the walk, uh, than it was going through cities. So generally, yeah, I avoided, uh, the cities for the most part. Mm -hmm. And you did get, at one point you got deathly ill, um, right before you went to Europe. Yeah. Did you have to go home? I was trying to work out like you flew home for, to recover and then you flew to Europe from there. Yeah. So I, I actually flew to Euro Europe first and it was already the bacterial infection was kind of, so for the listener, I finished the Americas. I flew home at, because I need to get Sedanus paperwork to get into Europe, like to get in, a dog into Europe, you need more than just a rabies vax and um, a health certificate you need. You got FDA, I think it's FDA approved. Um, certificate, you need a titer test. So it took like, it takes like two, three months. I think at the time it took three months. So I flew home. I started the process of that. I walked to Iceland, came back, got her paperwork, and then we went to Ireland. And by then I'd had this bacterial infection for the two, three months or so. And it was kind of just manifesting in really mild stomach pain. And it gradually built and it's like, oh, this is like, man, to have like, am I allergic to, you know, me? Am I lactose intolerant? It became a little more severe. So by the time I was walking Ireland, I was collapsing literally like with 10 out of 10 pain. Like it felt like my stomach was being pumped with uh, like a tire pump, an air pump. And then it would reach a point where it would just kind of snap and I would black out. And eventually I got to Scotland and I sat down after six miles of walking and I had never walked with less than 15 miles, even in the beginning, but I sat down after six miles of walking and was as tired as I had ever been. And I realized something was really seriously wrong. So I tried to push on, wasn't happening. I took a train to my cousin's home in London, spent a month in and out of infectious disease there. Then I flew home when they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me and I was running out of money and I flew home lived with my parents, went to GI, infectious disease, endocrinologists, all of these different doctors. They can figure it out, but they just started throwing antibiotics at me. And one of them started to work. And then I recovered. And then I flew back to Europe and started walking again, but from, not from Scotland, but from Denmark instead, because uh, I couldn't do the cold Scottish rain in my weakened state. <laughs> How hard was that to restart after all that time and recovering? Yeah, it was terrible. It, it was terrible. I, I was excited for it in, in a certain way because it's it's a great life, but I also knew how demanding it was. And when I got there, it proved to be the case. And I had spent maybe a month in the gym. Like I had recovered decent enough at home to start going to the gym and I would just torture myself on the stair stepper. I would be on there for like two hours, just pouring sweat, trying to get my legs back. But it's not the same as walking in eight hours a day even. And I was cramping a lot then. I'd get that real like deep of bone soreness, you know, where it's like beyond the muscle almost. And 
I would be achy, sleeping, and I just didn't have any muscle buildup. I had lost 45 pounds from the bacterial infection. And so I put most of that back on, but it wasn't, you know, the muscle that I needed. And then on top of that, I had been in pain for so long with the bacterial infection that mentally I was like a wreck. I was just, I was a kid basically, where if one thing went, went wrong, I, I, I couldn't take it. it. It destroyed my day. I'd throw a fit. And then when you're walking also, all the time is spent with yourself. It's you and yourself. It's you and your thoughts. And if you're not good company with yourself when you're walking, it is a really bad time. It is a really bad time. You have to have your thoughts in order to do these long walks. And if you don't have them in order, you'll get them in order because it's just not sustainable. But when I was walking down from Denmark down to Spain, I was, I was such a pessimist. I had built up so much of that, uh, held on to so much of that pain and agony that I was just mean to myself. And I was like, you're not good enough and you know whatever else. And why are you walking through the rain right now? What is the point of being out here? You could be back with your family and friends. You have no money, you're a loser, whatever else is just like, you know, you just become this, this like this jerk to yourself. And so it was really difficult. It was probably the most difficult time of my walk. And it wasn't until I got onto the Camino, the Camino de Santiago in Spain, that I had a community around me for the first time ever on my walk. And people were walking at the same pace as myself and we're going in the same direction and we're seeing the same things. And I had enough people around me where I can kind of get out of my head and remember like, oh, this is actually great. Like I, all I do is walk every day and, and I'm eating, you know, uh, I'm having a, a cappuccino and later I'm going to have some olives and some jamon and this is great. What am I complaining about? But it took that, uh, those few months and then it took the community to kind of get me out of that, that dark place. What was the greatest act of kindness you witnessed and what was the scariest moment that you witnessed during this, this whole adventure? I would say the greatest act of kindness. I mean, there's, there's a lot I could, I could go into and people have been really generous to me, but the one that comes to mind is, uh, Zeki. He is this hotel. Uh, he was a, a tourist guy and now he's a t hotelier in Istanbul. And he basically single-handedly got me across the Bosphorus bridge, uh, which cover, which spans the Bosphorus river, Bosphorus Strait from Europe into Asia in Istanbul. And no private citizen has ever crossed it on foot before me. It was protected by the military and that's it. Uh, you know, it's such an, it's such a viral bridge that they wouldn't allow any private citizens on it. And so he gradually gets me uh, through the Turkish bureaucracy and gets me permission. And it took him like two, three weeks or something like that. And we went to the mayor's office and we sent all these letters and we're reaching out to all these different people. It's like, this is a guy I didn't know. And his daughter said, hey, he has a, this guy, Tom has an interesting story. He put me up for three weeks in his hotel. And then we just worked our way uh, to try and get permission. Uh, and it's, it was just so remarkable because again, like I didn't know this guy. I came out of nowhere. I just walked from Denmark or whatever it is. And he's like, yeah, I'll help you. Sure, let's, let's do whatever we can. I'm gonna spend hours of my day trying to get you across this bridge. Uh, so that was incredible. Uh, and then scariest by a mile was um, getting held up at gunpoint in Turkey, uh, in Turkey again. And again, there's a lot of scary moments, but it's a long story. Ultimately, I get a shotgun put against me up in the mountains just north of Syria. And it was, such a like dark fear where it felt like it is what I always say. It feels like you're playing hide and seek and someone just opened the opens the bushes and they're like, they can tag you or they don't have to tag you. Like they found you. It's up to you whether you lose the game or not. And so before I was held up a knife point in Panama and when you're held up a knife point, you're kind of gaming. You're like, okay, what can I do to get out of this? You know, what do I, what can I grab onto? What can I use to defend myself? When you get the gun pointed against you, when it's pressing against your back, you're like, it's darkness. Uh, I hope they don't pull the trigger. That's it. So that was the scariest by mile. I was shaking like a leaf. What was the homecoming like for you um, after you had you had circumnavigated the globe? And what was kind of surprising to you about the homecoming, about how you felt coming back to New Jersey? The homecoming was after over seven years of walking, uh, roughly 28,000 miles, roughly 25 of them with Savannah. And by the end, 
I was so sick of walking. <laughs> I was ready to be done. I was ready to be done for months. And the baby carriage I was pushing that is so useful. I was ready to freaking throw that thing into the dumpster, into like a trash compactor. I never wanted to see that thing again. And I, and, and every morning when I would, you know, I had the same routine and I had it so down exactly how to break my tent, pack my things, put it in. And then at night, unpack it, pop it in. I was like, I don't want to do that again. I've done that so many times. I'm so done with it. So by the time the homecoming came and I walked these last nine miles without the cart from Philadelphia to my parents' home in New Jersey and to this, the tap room, uh, this bar and grill where the homecoming was, I had a group of people with me. I, I told some people, hey, you know, I'm going to be here. You can join me if I want. And then behind the scenes, my sister, my mom, the town were organizing this homecoming and I didn't know what to expect. So I leave, I cross the Ben Franklin Bridge. I have probably about 20 people walking with me. And that alone is incredible. And I'm, your Forrest Gump moment. <laughs> uh, yeah, total Forrest Gump. And after walking alone all the time, it was really cool. Uh, and then, you know, two people, two uh, apartment buildings along the Ben Franklin had signs, go Tom. People were whistling, cheering for me. I'd just been on... Uh, Fox, uh, Good Day Philadelphia. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's, uh, like had a little celeb and had the news crews out there. And I walked these last nine miles and people are stopping and they're cheering me on. And then the crowd gets bigger and bigger as I get into town. And so by the time I reach the tap room, you know, I have like a, I don't know, maybe 40 people walking with me, something like that. And then as I approach the finish line, there's a line, like uh, uh, the whole block is packed with people. And then towards the end is, 200, 300 people. And I turned the corner and there's this big balloon archway, hundreds of people there. And I crossed that finish line. And it wasn't this moment of like great triumph where you throw your fist in the air and you let out this belt after scoring a touchdown or something like that. It was just relief. Because I, I gave up a lot to walk around the world. You sacrifice a lot. It's not this lifestyle that you can kind of be half in half out when you're out walking you're not with your family you're not with your friends you're not under a roof you give up a lot and i'd also like chained myself essentially to that idea from 17. i was like you're going to do this thing no matter what it takes and so to finally be done with it it was just this exhale like oh it's over i did it kind of i can move on with my life in a certain way and and then the next three months though were like cloud nine, you know, I was in heaven. I had did it. I, I completed my dream and, and nothing could possibly go wrong. And then after those three months, after that cloud nine, I had this thought while walking down the street with Savannah, I thought like, it keeps going. Like I thought after I completed my dream, life would just be over and, and you know, I wouldn't need to do anything else. But then I realized you can keep living your life without this really pinpoint focus. And then since then it's been an adjustment and I've, I've gotten used to it, but yeah, it was a strange, it was a strange experience, uh, ending the walk. It wasn't like this, it wasn't pure triumph, I would say, but it was incredibly, incredibly satisfying. Also, I'm sure you, you experienced people, obviously everyone's asking you about it. You find yourself saying the same things over and over, but in, in my experience, People will ask, but they're not really that interested in hearing the details, right? And so talk a little bit about that. Like, how did you kind of, you, you're now doing motivational speaking. You have this book out. Um, books take a while to write. So, you know, you finished your walk, what, a couple of years ago? So you would have had to start the book around then. So just how, how did, what was the genesis of all of that? Did you know you were going to write a book nearing the end of your walk? Did you know you were going to become a motivational speaker or was that something that just happened organically from people asking you about it? You thought, hmm, some people are really interested in this story and maybe there's some takeaways that I can express that would, you know, turn, convert into a new profession. The, the writing I knew kind of from the beginning of the walk, I knew I wanted to write a book, but it wasn't until a couple months out from the homecoming when my agent Mark reached out to me and was like, hey, I think we should pitch your story to write a book. And so when the walk ended, I, I had, uh, maybe not a deal, but we were pitching the story around. So I knew I was going to write a book. So I knew that, and that was helpful and clarifying. And then the motivational speaking that came organically. I never thought of that as a profession. I didn't know it could be, 
but I had Pinterest invited me to like their yearly offsite. And then I spoke at a photography uh, conference thing that they just heard my story and you know, wanted me to talk about my story. And they paid great. And I was like, oh, wow, like you can make money doing this. And then an agent, again, I guess heard my story on PBS or something like that. She found me and she's like, you can make a living doing this. And so um, it kind of worked out where it's really the perfect situation. I feel very fortunate in that way because the walk, uh, the speaking is not that demanding time-wise and it pays pretty well. Whereas the writing takes all your time and it pays horribly. <laughs> so it's the perfect combo where I spent like 10, 12 hours a day for two years after the walk, writing this book and refining the book. And then I would pop in for a speaker gig and not like I was making, you know, I'm still not like making crazy money, but I make enough to live and I get to write. Uh, so very fortunate in that way. Uh, but one was, yeah, one is like, I knew I was going to write the book and then the speaking just kind of happened, you know, luckily. You didn't have to go out and get a job then once you got back home after all the fanfare and everything kind of wore off. Oh man, that would be scary. Oof. <laughs> go back to the Indian restaurant. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I mean, that would be very well. <laughs> Oh, man, that's awesome. Um, okay, cool. So did people reach out to you and say, hey, I want to walk around the world. Do you have any advice for me? And, and are any of them doing it right now? Do you know? Because a lot of people will say that, but, you know. Yeah, I've had, I've had a lot of people. I, I would say at least a couple dozen people say. Well, so his cousin wants to talk to you because he wants he's thinking about doing it, you know. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's probably about, yeah, like, you know two, three dozen people that have asked, hey, I'm gonna walk around the world, can you give me some advice? And I try and be as generous with my time as possible and, and give them advice. But the first thing I'll say is like, this isn't like a thing you do lightly. Like I was like, like this idea was burnt into my head and I felt like I was on fire when I was beginning. And I think if you don't have that, it is going to suck and you're never gonna finish it because you have to have some sort of like unnatural conviction that your whole identity is tied up in this thing. And that if you give up, you'll be destroyed because you can't cross mountain after mountain, walk through the jungle, walk through the desert without some really deep, significant drive behind it. And so I would tell, I tell these people this and, you know, let them decide, do they have it? Do they not have it? But no, I don't think anyone from anyone that I felt he was walking around the world. Let's say someone was serious about doing something like that. Right. Cause I think, you know, it's really a story of overcoming adversity. What are two or three things that you would say to someone who was about to tackle a massive endeavor like walking around the world? I would say, like, be okay with living one life. If you really have your eye set on some big mission, be okay with the sacrifices that come with it. Because every life is going to come with sacrifices. But if you have some massive aim that's going to come with more sacrifices and you have to be okay with living and walking the path that you want to walk and and not walking those other paths and not being half in half out uh, and then i would say the other thing is like give it time i think people underestimate how much time things take they want everything to happen right away and you want to feel like well if i just get this then everything's going to take off and then i just get this and wow then i'm really going to be there and it's not like that everything is very gradual your growth is gradual the the writing of the book is gradual the the walk you know it eight years before i was able to even take my first step and then it was seven years of doing it all that's gradual and when i was out there too i, I had this thought all the time when you know a new media thing would cover me like the dodo or whatever i'm like oh once this comes out then i'm then i'm gonna make it and it's like no it it, it doesn't it's a little thing it helps a little bit but the world is bigger than you realize and things take lo longer than you realize so i would say just give yourself time to grow and be okay with it taking a while, but be consistent. Has your perception of distance reverted back to the pre-walking days? Yeah. <laughs> Where yeah, you yeah, as, <laughs> we're across town, you think about, oh, I, we could just walk. It's not a big deal. Or you like get in the car. And I definitely, it's definitely still warped from other people because I still will, I'm willing to walk or bike longer than basically everyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember I used to think like, when something was three miles away, I like, I have these conversations at, like after the walk, 
I'm like, I was three miles away. And I was like, oh, it's going to work. Oh, it's going to take an hour to get there. And they're like, no, it'll take two minutes. Just get in the car and go there. I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. Like, oh, I forgot about that. I forgot about the car. Right. <laughs> So, Lana, you're in love now. You just got engaged, right? In Paris? Yeah, yeah, just last Monday. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, you guys met in in uh, Washington, and then she kind of met you at different points along the journey. Talk a little bit about that. Like, how did you know that that relationship was the one for you? And um, And what's the plan now? I know she's a doctor or something like this. Yeah, we're living in Kentucky. She's doing her residency at University of Cincinnati. And I think when I met her, I don't think I would have recognized probably how important she was or how great she was if when I was younger. But after the years of walking and you just spend so much time with yourself and you meet so many people that you are really able to define and refine what matters to you in a person. And I think what I realized that mattered most to me, uh, uh, then, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of different things, but the thing I valued the most is that I remember when, when I would walk into a room with her and she would like light up and she's like, Oh, I'm so glad you're here. And it's like, that's how I want someone to react to me. You know, the person I spend my life with, I want that person to be excited to hang out with me. And so I put a lot of weight on that. And, and then, you know, obviously she's, she's great in a lot of other ways where she was born in Alaska. And so she just, and she worked in a tire, her parents owned a tire shop. She'd been working there since she was like seven. So she just does everything. Basically. I was like, this is great. She is, you know, if I want to go horseback riding, she's down. If you want to go, you know, hiking, she's down. If we want to do, you know, uh, you know, motocross, like she's way better than I would ever be on that. And so she's kind of a do it everything, uh, girl, a uh, woman, which I, which I value. Uh, but I, I do think it's a, it's the kind of thing that I think if I was younger, I would have been like, there's got to be something better up ahead. You know, you always kind of have that, I think, especially when you're young, that something up ahead is going to be better. But after all the walking and traveling, I realized, oh, no, this is a good thing. Just hold on to the good thing. That's enough. You also mentioned, I think this is important to mention that you had a little bit of depression uh, afterward because your big mission had been accomplished and you're thinking, okay, what's next? What do I do next? Does it have to be at the same scale as this other thing that I've done? Where are you now with, with that? I'm in a weird spot with that. I am not depressed. I, that lasted maybe two months um, after the afterglow kind of wore off from the walk. Uh, the book helped me get rid of that a lot because it gave me that similar focus and I could just like, I'm doing 10, 12 hours a day on this thing and let all my thoughts coalesce around it. But now the book's over and, you know, I don't have that really pinpoint focus. And I, I think I would like to have it back, but I've also become a little bit more comfortable. I think it's just time with just being a person and existing and reading a little bit and hanging out with my friends and, and going for a walk and being okay with that. I think I have enough space between when the walk was over and, and now that I, I've adjusted. And, and the other difficult thing about going from walking and that big dream, aside from it being a big dream, is that it was a very different physically lifestyle where when the walk was over, I would still walk like five hours a day with Savannah because I didn't know what to do with myself. Otherwise, I, I would try and sit down and write. And it's like, I can't sit down for 20 minutes. I'm going crazy. Uh, so that was, it was also, I think, a very physical adjustment that I've gotten over. She probably needed to walk, I imagine, after having walked for so long, right? Every oh, day. yeah. She would sit by the door and be like, yo, dude, come on. <laughs> Are you going to get another Savannah? I know Savannah passed away. Uh, I, in time, yeah. I think maybe next summer, something like that, it it like is in my head more and more and I'm definitely a dog person, but, uh, I think not yet, you know, I, not yet. Final question. How do you think about success these days? Having had these experiences? Success is if I can have enough money to live and hang out with the people I love, that is like the ultimate success. If I'm making like 45 grand a year, but I have time and I have people I love around me, I, you know, that's as wealthy as you can get, I would say. Beautiful, man. Thank you so much. The World Walk is the book. Um, seven years, 28,000 miles, six continents. Incredible feed. Congratulations on 
your book and, and all the success you're having and, um, and you're speaking. So um, hopefully if someone's listening to this and they're looking for a keynote speaker for the conference or convention or whatever, you know, you've got a great story and uh, Appreciate it. that's some incredible images to accompany your story. So hopefully they can bring you in. Yeah. Appreciate it. You're a good interviewer. Thank you for reading the book and taking the time to craft some thoughtful questions. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching. Just FYI, we post a new video almost every day. So make sure you comment and subscribe below so you don't miss out on anything. And if you enjoyed this video, I think you're really going to love this one as well. And if you ever want to see a playlist of all of my podcasts or all of the plot twists or any other category of videos, you can find links to those in the description below.